Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kobus van Staden. Um, I, I'm joining you today in, in a kind of a joint uh, capacity. I'm, I'm a China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs, and I'm also the co-host with Eric Olander of the China Africa, uh, China and Africa podcast, um, in which we, we talk everything China-Africa. Um, so we're delighted to, that you're joining us today uh, for this uh, for this installment of of the Kerry um, of the the the, the Kerry Pan Africa Lending Conference. Um, <clears throat> fanta like I'd really like to extend my thanks to Johns Hopkins University for for hosting this um, and and for bringing all of us together. So. You know, um, and just uh, just for all of you who are joining us, uh, please keep in mind this is this is the third installment of of the weekly series, um, and and it will con uh, will there'll be weekly installments until the 18th of May. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today. Um, today we're, we're talking about not only about loans and lending, but particularly also about how to research loans and lending. Um, so these are two nested issues. Um, the, over the last two years or so, we've seen increasing controversy around the scale and the, the methodology of Chinese lending to the global south, um, with Africa playing a particularly large role in that discussion. Um, in the process, we've also seen over the last several years, we've seen the development of, of major new scholarship on, on Chinese lending to the global south. Um, and you know, one of the things I think that that's, that's really important to, to keep in mind is that any real discussion about debt and, and the, the implications of debt and lending is also a discussion about the methodology of researching debt and lending. Um, the, the doing research on this field is incredibly complex, um, and the way one does research one particular one's particular methodology and the, one's particular one's particular approach also subtly shifts the kind of data one is working with. So the very discussion about the feasibility or the desirability of, of particular Chinese loans also, uh, also depends fundamentally on how that those loans are researched and the kind of tools we bring to the table. So today we're, we're delighted to bring some of the most prominent um, voices on Chinese lending um, to a single roundtable discussion in which we'll take a very wonky, very deep dive into the nitty gritty of doing research on these issues and the way that different research methodologies, um, you know, subtly end up shaping the kind of data we're working with. Um, <clears throat> so. We're going to kick this off with, with a, a brief intro from each individual panelist um, in which they will very quickly um, talk a little bit about the, the particular way they work. Um, so we, we're delighted to kick off firstly with, uh, with Deborah Bratigam, um, who's the director of the China Africa Research Initiative and the Bernard, Bernard L. Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy at the Paul H. Nitzer School of, of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Um, she is a, a leading expert on China and Africa generally um, and Chinese lending in Africa particularly um, and the, the author of um, Will, Will Africa Feed China and The Dragon's Gift, The Real Story of China and Africa as well as Chinese Aid in African Development Exporting Green Revolution. So um, Deborah, please, please, please take it away. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Kobus. And thank you very much to you and Eric for moderating our, our roundtable on Chinese data today, uh, the roundtable for walks. So we hope we're going to get down and, and get into the data. And that's going to be really exciting. I'm going to um, just briefly uh, share my screen to show you what we've got here. Um, our data is now at Boston University. Um, so we've been we've transferred it over there and they're going to be running it, but we still have it over here at Kerry as well. So I'll share my screen. So um, this is the Chinese Loans to Africa database and we've collected uh, information about these loans and you can, you can see how it works here, 153 billion um, from 2000 to 2019. We have 1,141 loans in the database. And in the interactive feature, which is on the Boston University website, if you click on any one of these uh, countries, you can get a deeper dive into the loans. So that would be the amount in Sudan, 69 loans in these different sectors here. And down at the bottom, you can see the different years in which the loans were given. 
So over to the side, we have more information. So we collect a number of different um, things associated with the projects that are, are funded by this. So this is in Sudan again. Um, you can see the sectors, you can see the lender. So sometimes it's a company that provides the loan. So that would be a supplier's credit or the China Exim Bank, the Chinese government, which, which are the foreign aid, zero interest loans, um, or it doesn't seem to be anything from China Development Bank here. But you can see down there the number of different Chinese lenders. And we have about 30 different Chinese lenders in our database. So um, from 2000 to 2010, about 75% of the loans were from China Exim Bank. But after 2010 to the present, China Exim Bank just provides 50%. And so that means 50% of all the other uh, loans are provided by different lenders and often commercial banks. Um, the other fields that we have, we look at, we have uh, now data on contractors. So there's some very interesting relationships between the banks and the contractors that we're exploring. Uh, the type of finance, what kind of loan is it, the terms when we have them, and the borrower. And then we have um, another uh, column over here about whether or not there's a resource security for the loan. So all of this data can be downloaded uh, on Excel sheets, country by country, which with any of these different elements in there, or the whole data set can be downloaded in Excel form. Um, and we hope that you'll come and play around in the data. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Um, before I forget, uh, we also we we the, today's discussion is going to be a roundtable discussion. So um, so we want to um, we want to urge everyone to please submit questions, um, and that roundtable discussion will be moderated by uh, my my podcast colleague Eric Olander. Um, so please feel free if you have any questions to put your questions into the Q and A section um, of Zoom, um, and and once we will we'll get around to once we get around to the discussion, um, Eric will will kind of direct those to our speakers. Um, second um, today is, is Kevin uh, P. Gallagher, uh, who's a professor of global development policy at Boston University's Frederick, Frederick S. Pardy School of Global Studies, uh, where he directs the Global Development Policy Center. Um, he's written a lot on, on Chinese lending to Latin America, um, and the GDP Center is now also hosting ca um, Carrie's uh, database. So, so, you know, it opens um, fantastic opportunities to do cross, you you know, cross research between Africa and Latin America as well. Um, so, um, you know, we'll, you know, kind of as, as part of this, this work, um, I'm, I'm inviting Ke Kevin to also please um, comment on how they do their work. Thanks, Kobus. Uh, great to see everyone on the panel and thanks everyone from, for coming, regardless of what uh, time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I direct the Global Development Policy Center, and within it, we have something called the Global China Initiative that tracks Chinese overseas development finance and looks at its social, economic, and environmental outcomes. One of our signature programs is called Data, Data for Analysis, Transparency, and Accountability, where we build a bunch of data sets on Chinese overseas development finance and engage in collaborative research with researchers in Beijing, uh, Indonesia, the Andean Amazon, and Southern Africa to look at the trends, determinants, and outcomes of this finance. I should say that our center focuses solely on the policy banks, the two overseas policy banks that are, operate overseas, the China Development Bank and the Export-Import Bank of China. We now uh, have a family of about five of these databases that are all interactive, like the one that Deborah just showed, and that can be found on our webpage. I'll put it in the chat after my chat here. Um, one of them is called, the first one is called the China Latin America Finance Database, which we do with the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington and based off of the size carry methodology. Second is the China, China's Global Energy Finance Database that tracks China's overseas development finance in the energy sector. Third is one called China's Global Power Database, which just looks at China's overseas development finance and foreign direct investment in the electric power sector around the world. And the largest one that we operate is something called the China's Overseas Development Finance Database, which attempts to put together a global estimate of CDB and Export-Import Bank financing from 2008 to 2019, and also geolocates all of the projects to their geolocated specific uh, coordinates uh, on Earth. And as Deborah noted, 
We also house now, uh, in collaboration with Size Carry, the China Africa Loans Database. In a nutshell, uh, our methodology combines both bottom up and sort of top down methodologies. I'll put our methodological notebook uh, in the chat, chat right here. We have a global set of algorithms that scrape the web in a, in a variety of different languages around the world. Uh, and also a team of folks working from the ground up sleuthing about things that we hear about um, and come to a closure in what we call the double verification method. If we can find uh, the project noted on say, both the Latin America side and the China side, um, then it goes into the database. So our data is often a, a little conservative. We only uh, look at projects that are already off the ground, uh, not those that are proposed. Some quick highlights on what we find uh, in between 2008 and 2019. We find that these two policy banks have provided lending to foreign governments around the world upward around $460 billion. So that's about the same as the World Bank during the same period. However, it's highly concentrated in about uh, 10 countries, 62% of it is in 10 countries and 72% of it is in infrastructure and energy. Um, the composition of it is uh, in addition to being in infrastructure and energy within the energy sector, it's highly concentrated in hydroelectric power plants and in coal-fired power plants. We've done a number of studies on these and it's concerning about the global emissions and local emission impacts of the coal-fired power plants, especially given the fact that coal is increasingly a stranded asset in the world economy. And some of these hydropower projects that we've studied in the Andean Amazon uh, accentuate social conflict and environmental degradation as well. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, next up is, is Matthew Minji, uh, who's a senior analyst at the Rodium, Rodium Group, um, and which is a, a private sector economic research firm, where he focuses on emerging market finance and China's economic diplomacy. Uh, he oversees the group's database on debt renegotiations involving China and tracks the impact of China's global aid, loan, and investment flows. Um, Matthew, um, it'll be very interesting to hear how, how you, you guys' kind of methodology differs from the academic kind of research we, we've discussed up to now. Go ahead. Thanks, Kobus, and thanks to the other panelists. And yes, Kobus, I'm, I'm also excited to get into it because Rhodium Group uh, is a little bit different as a private economic research firm. Uh, and the question that we look at is a little bit different uh, in our standing databases, um, whereas Dr. Brodigram uh, and Professor Gallagher are, are really looking at outbound lending amounts and trying to identify shifts in, in how those may or may not be changing. Uh, Rodium Group has decided to focus in on a question that is not just a, a COVID question, but has uh, been in the works for some time, uh, which is what is happening to loans that run into trouble and how are it's China and how are borrowers handling loans that come under distress or need to be renegotiated. So starting in 2019, since that point in time, uh, we've been maintaining a database of China's overseas loan renegotiations. Um, we tend to take a very, very broad view. Uh, we're looking at all actors. That includes uh, first MoFCOM, now SIDCA, uh, China's uh, state aid agency. We look at policy banks, including CDB and Exim. But we also cover restructurings uh, involving commercial banks, where those details, which are scanned, are available. And we also take a broad view of the types of contracts uh, or the types of loans, the types of interactions that can come under renegotiation. Our database includes both loans that are renegotiated, but also occasionally resource contracts, including oil repurchase agreements, if those are changed, which undergirds so many of China's resource-backed loans uh, in Africa and uh, Latin America. Our database, however, does share, uh, I think, a lot of features in common with the methodologies that were pioneered uh, at SaiskARI and at BU. And then it is an open source database that involves double verification. Uh, we don't have any sort of special connections or personal connections to, to borrowers or inside China's aid and lending architecture. Uh, but we rely upon highly trained analysts that are steeped not just in development finance, but also in knowledge of China's institutions uh, that uh, employ double verification methods to, to get any information that they can. Uh, our database, as a consequence, covers both the principal amount of loans that have come under renegotiation and wherever we can find details on the specific relief, uh, specific amount uh, of change in the value of those loans as a result of the renegotiation. Um, it'll be really interesting for me uh, to participate, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the panel uh, to, to see how methodologies are changing and how your interests are changing. Um, but certainly the debt renegotiation database at, at Rhodium has, has tracked uh, 
uh, major changes in China's outbound lending stance and its renegotiation stance. Uh, we now count over 150 cases. I think we're up to 154 or 155 cases. Uh, that include both instances of write-offs of zero interest loans, uh, renegotiations of uh, major loans from policy or commercial banks, and uh, resource contracts that have come under uh, changes. And if you total just the loans that we cover, uh, you're looking at uh, somewhere north of uh, 90 billion, and indeed now in the latest iteration post uh, 2020, uh, over 100 billion dollars of loans that have come under renegotiation. Um, some of those renegotiations are not finished; they are ongoing, uh, and some of them are uh, being announced or have been announced more recently. Whether it's on the DSSI initiative or under the Common Framework, uh, but it is something that Rodium Group continues to track uh, and publish. Uh, we publish updates semi-regularly. Our latest, latest one, rather, was in late 2020, and we're hoping to put together uh, another update uh, next month or uh, potentially at the start of the summer. So we're looking forward to the, the discussion, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more about how uh, other researchers are, are tackling the challenge of looking at China's overseas finance uh, and how to solve the, the problem of uh, limited transparency in certain circumstances. Uh, while also taking a look at the complexity of China's overseas lending institutions and the complexity of, of factors that influence borrowers um, in a, a difficult time worldwide. Thanks, thanks, Matthew. Um, a quick note to everyone, um, Anna Galpin, uh, who's the, the Anne Fleming Research Professor at Georgetown and also a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, she can only join us from 10 o'clock um, Eastern time. Um, so we'll take a quick break in the middle of the discussion when she joins us just to just to get a similar kind of explanation from her um, about their own their, their work. Um, but before that, uh, we're delighted that we're also joined by Evis Ruchai, who is a senior economist and statistician at the World Bank. Um, she has over 20 years of experience on policy relevant external sector statistics, um, and she leads the, the debt data team of the development data group at the World Bank. Please keep in mind that Evis is, um, because of her of work commitment, she's, she's unable to discuss and break down the, the situation of spe facing specific countries. Um, however, you know, kind of like she, you know, she, she's free to discuss kind of broader methodology and, and kind of broader trends. Um, Evis, uh, please go ahead and, and, and give us a a brief introduction in, into how you work. Thank you. Uh, this is a really uh, very interesting roundtable, and especially in this pandemic, and the effect of uh, this pandemic in the global economy has highlighted once again the need for data, timely and accurate data. And uh, this has been recurrent in every crisis, economic crisis, and health crisis in the in the world. Um, I just want to uh, introduce a little bit of what the bank does and what is the contribution of the bank uh, into the compilation and dissemination of external debt statistics. It's been uh, since 1952 when the bank has uh, maintained the data reporting system in a very detailed database that was governed by a policy of the bank that uh, requires all the uh, borrowers uh, of the bank, IBRD IDA borrowers, to report to the bank in a very detailed format. Um, their borrowing of the government, uh, public corporation, state or enterprises, and further private non-guaranteed debt. Uh, ongoing efforts to bring this uh, uh, debt transparency and external debt uh, data uh, have always raised the question, what is the data that the bank collects and how the international debt statistics are uh, defining the external debt? Well, data that are uh, collected by the bank are in a very, very detailed uh, uh, basis. It's a loan by loan or debt instrument basis. And we constantly uh, improve the methodologies based on international standards set in the in international community to collect better the information on the borrowing uh, of the countries. Uh, and we have our specific um, methodology when it comes to classification of this debt by public, private, and further into official or non-official creditors. Uh, in 1952, this uh, uh, database has been started um, collecting information and have this information. And digitally, we have this information since 1970, when with the 1976 crisis, this uh, database became public to the, to the, um, to the users with a very uh, detailed breakdown on the flows and stocks, payments, uh, commitment amounts and, uh, and as of today we have improved this coverage by 
uh, including more dead instruments as per all the standards. And um, further, we have, uh, as you know, the agenda of the bank is to improve the transparency of the countries, not only in the reporting to the bank, but also to the, uh, uh, their citizens uh, to have a better understanding of what debt is and how much debt uh, the government or public sector owe to the uh, external uh, creditors or also domestic creditors. We have uh, broken down more detailed information on uh, the borrowing of the countries by debtor type, debtor entities, creditor type, creditor countries this year, which was pretty big, uh, you know, uh, disclosure of information from the World Bank. Uh, we have been uh, quite um, meticulously, um, you know, observing how the borrowing pattern has have changed throughout the years. And especially in the last decade, it's been quite a lot of switch from traditional borrowing to more unconventional borrowing. Uh, well, we, um, we found out that through the DSSI, um, Debt Relief Suspension Initiative, we uh, realized that China has been, uh, you know, quite a big creditor onto those low and uh, low income countries, especially those DSI participating countries. And there is a quite a trend which shows that the non-traditional uh, lending has been quite dominant into the low income countries. Uh, from 2013 to 2019, we see quite a lot of uh, um, the different terms, different uh, uh, lending processes, and there are a few uh, lending instruments that are still very un uh, vague and unclear when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, currency swaps or um, deposit of foreign official entities at the central bank from another central bank. So those are parts of the you know, using of the leverage of flows, which is pretty much that. So there are so many things that uh, we are working on to have a better understanding and better uh, transparency on the data, the country's report and the publication that the World Bank has uh, regarding the uh, creditor countries and how we classify, how we measure the data. And, uh, you know, there is a quite a big database that the bank has with 120 countries, low and middle income, with all the information on flows and stocks and more specifically by debt instruments and by maturity. Thanks so much, Evis. Um, finally, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce um, Eric Olander, who's, who's my colleague on the China Africa uh, podcast and the China Africa project. Um, his work includes following China Africa and China Global South relations on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we've seen over the last 10 years is an increasing emphasis on, on debt and increasing kind of controversies around debt. So the issue isn't only the debt itself, but also how, also the, the many different ways, sometimes misleading ways that that debt is covered um, by the international press. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad to hand over to Eric, who will then um, kick off the, the Q&A between all of the participants. Well, thank you, Kobus, and a very good morning to everybody. And thank you all the panelists for having this discussion. Um, we've adjusted the format of this panel to make it wonky for wonks and for you, the panelists. So we cut down the introductions and the presentations in order to allow more time for Q&A uh, from the audience. So go ahead and start putting your questions in. We will fill up the time with, we have tons of questions, but this is really the dream team of the overseas development finance world. And it's a rare opportunity to be able to put questions directly to Avis and uh, Professor Braudigam and uh, Professor Gallagher. So, and also to Cobus as well. So go ahead and start putting your questions. Uh, Deborah, we're gonna start with you, but I'm gonna ask the same question to all the panelists. Uh, Daniel Erasmus, and you've already answered it in the chat. Uh, asked you about methodology, and I, given that we are here to talk wonky research stuff, let's talk about methodology. So, Deborah, let's first talk with start with you and the methodology that you and the Carry team used, and then Kevin will come to you to talk about that. Thanks, Eric. Uh, well, we call our methodology forensic internet sleuthing, and um, I really it is like detective work. Um, we do use the, the internet. We also use our, um, our extensive network. Um, we try to confirm things with uh, ministers of finance that we happen to know or people who are working in the field, uh, Chinese contractors. You know, We try to um, confirm with our contacts as well as uh, just doing work on the internet. 
So we, again, like the other people on the, except for Evis, the other people on the panel, we don't have official um, access to any of this information. And uh, our Chinese contacts are not very forthcoming, but occasionally we can confirm projects with them. So forensic internet sleuthing, it's a little bit like those detective shows where you have you know, a big whiteboard and you've got a, a crime and then you, you pull in all the different uh, pieces of evidence to try to figure out who, who done it. And so we will have a, a project that we find out is um, in the media somewhere is mentioned as uh, perhaps it's been financed by a Chinese source. And so then we try to uh, use all these different methods, including satellite imagery to try to find out if the project has actually started. Uh, we look at contractor websites to see if there's a mention of the contract or the project on their website. Of course, our, our prime and our most useful source of information is the debt management offices and the ministries of finance in the borrowing countries. And, and oftentimes uh, there will be a mention there. We look at parliament websites because many countries require um, these loans to be uh, confirmed by parliament. So they have to run them by. And so we'll see discussions in the parliamentary minutes uh, of the loans. So countries vary also in their transparency over time some of our best data on Angola, for example, has come from the Ministry of Finance, and they have from time to time posted all of their loan finance projects uh, and every disbursement for those projects on their website. So we've been able to scrape that information and then it'll disappear. So, and there is a lot of that appearing and disappearing that happens. And I don't think it's necessarily that the countries are trying to hide these things. They just will do a website update and then the links will break and there will be, you know, it, it doesn't uh, work the way it did before. And so that, that will happen. Of course, sometimes they are trying to hide things, but, but by and large, it's, uh, we, we see it more as a capacity issue than a deliberate uh, attempt to, um, to try to get these things out of the public. There are some countries though, and, and I can point to Zambia um, in, in this instance that used to be much more transparent and then stopped being as transparent in recent years. So it's been much less uh, helpful, but it's, um, it's a fun process. And I think because we are all data wonks, we, we love to get together and just get one of these really problem loans there. And then we have our multi-lingual team of research assistants that are looking at the French uh, language websites and the Chinese language websites and the English websites. And then uh, sometimes when, when they're all together in a room, which, which they, they still do in a Zoom room, um, calling out the information that they're finding and the confirmations that they're finding is re really quite exciting. So we're detectives. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Kevin, can you talk to us a little bit about how your methodology may be similar or different than what Carrie's doing? Sure, and I, I think I'll speak for everybody who does this kind of work is that we all see this as an art, uh, certainly not a science. And this is something that's uh, problematic across the sphere. And, and I think it's important to point out it's, it's not unique to China. I think we can uh, credit the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund where you can get about 70% of, of whatever you'd want just from freely downloading it. But it's, it's really a, a chronic gap when it comes to national level uh, entities that are globally active, the United States Export Import Bank, the OPIC, the old OPIC in the US, very hard to get that data. Japan, uh, French Development Bank, uh, German Development Bank. It's, it's all very difficult for us to do uh, comparative analysis and to get granular about it. Um, and now we're learning um, as Matthew has, has hinted at, that it's, it's, it's much more of a problem than just a bunch of wonks trying to do academic research, but this is a fundamental problem in the global economy now because there's so much debt distress in the world economy and nobody knows the magnitude uh, and distribution of country debt profiles as we have a looming debt crisis uh, over us. I'll share a screen really quick. I put our methodology book in the chat um, and this is just our, our, basic, uh, our basic methodology, uh, very much derived off of the size carry with, a, with sort of a new algorithm ap approach on top of it. So we are uh, bottom level sleuths uh, in the way that uh, Deborah uh, mentioned. We, our team is out there looking for things all the time, hearing things either, either through the news or through case studies that we're doing. 
Um, and then we also have a algorithmic web crawler that uh, crawls across the web uh, in a variety of different languages. And we're working to get the two of them to meet together through double verification that can be through conversations with the different entities in China uh, or and or with uh, government officials uh, and government websites on uh, on the on the host country on the host country end. We try to update these every year. One of them just every other year. And often you'll see um, things that we thought were loans didn't turn out to be loans, or things uh, that um, we thought were about to start didn't quite start. And so uh, all of our data is freely downloadable on our webpage, but I encourage folks to go each year to download the most recent one and look at the accompanying technical notes which show, oh, this particular uh, loan in Bolivia uh, was postponed and it was 2008 at $200 million and now it's 2011 at $274 million, et cetera. Thanks. Okay, hey, Matt, let's come to you. There's a question from Winslow when he says, when different wonks say loans, they are all using the same language to describe the same phenomenon. How does that language relate to export credits, development finance, debt instruments? Furthermore, should wonks and or practitioners, which I presume he's referring to you guys, call loans, quote unquote, investments? Uh, it's a fair question, I think, especially in the China context, um, because so much, I think, of what we've seen of uh, China's overseas activity and uh, its lending activity, investment activity, um, well, uh, it involves many different tools. Sometimes it uh, can blur the line between what would be seen as a traditional export credit uh, or traditional aid. Part of that has to do with transparency, but it also has to do with uh, certain instruments uh, that are uh, administered in a different way. So for example, uh, China Exim Bank runs China's uh, official aid lending program, uh, government concessional loans, but it also administers preferential export buyers credits, which are subsidized, but not aid. And then uh, traditional sort of vanilla export credits. Um, one thing I think that is a, a good distinction to maintain and something that the Rhodium Group maintains uh, is that there is a difference between lending uh, and investment. Uh, there is a difference between taking an equity stake uh, in a project, although uh, establishing uh, in certain vehicles, contracting vehicles, special purpose vehicles may be associated with a uh, big infrastructure project. It is not the same thing uh, as China Exim or consortium of lenders coming in and providing debt financing for large scale uh, infrastructure. Um, and I think that it is important uh, to distinguish between um, and be clear about what we what we are talking about um, when you're trying to get a handle on China's overseas finance. Um, I definitely see uh, in media reports and sometimes even other academic reports mixing and matching, um, say, a, a private investment, uh, whether that's in a special economic zone or in a, a, an African corporation, uh, with the contracting uh, uh, the contracting contract, the actual construction contract uh, with the potential loan contract. And so you end up mixing and matching the actors that are important and it makes it a lot more difficult to, to see who's doing what uh, and then to bring in what the potential impact could be on the, the recipient country. Um, part of what Rhodium does then uh, is what we rely upon the excellent data sets from Dr. Gallagher and from Dr. Brodigram for information on China's overseas lending activity. Uh, and we do collect our own uh, database on lending renegotiations. Uh, we tend to, when we're looking specifically at investment, uh, do a real careful country by country analysis. Well, we don't have a global uh, investment monitor uh, along the lines of the global investment tracker from AEI. Uh, we do start from the ground up and uh, as part of that process, if we're trying to get a situation of China's overall uh, flows to a country in Southeast Asia or in Africa, uh, we really take a step to make sure uh, for any sort of commitment or for any sort of uh, flow that we're seeing to verify, is it investment? Is it going uh, to, to set up physical infrastructure uh, or is it going uh, to an equity stake in a given group? or uh, is it a loan that is meant to be repaid? Um, certainly something that's interesting uh, is the question of uh, bond finance, whether or not you wanna call that uh, lending. I do think you should distinguish between different types of debt instruments that are out there. Um, but again, uh, in practice, it can be sometimes very, very difficult, especially when you're dealing with uh, countries or lending uh, or investment environments that uh, have a paucity of information. There can sometimes be a language barrier, translation issues. Uh, and uh, you might not necessarily know or be able to distinguish from your first source, your second source. It can take many hours of research sometimes to solve that simple question.
So Avis, Matt has painted a much more complicated picture. And based on Winslow's question, I think there's, a, there's some interesting insights here in terms of the variety of tools and debts that are there. And you talked about unconventional borrowing. And I do pity you and your colleagues at the World Bank because 20 years ago, your job was much easier. It was World Bank and IMF and the multilaterals and the Paris Club and more or less the G7 and a few bilaterals. Today, the, the debt picture is much more difficult to monitor. So I guess my question is when you hear from private creditors who are wondering how much does the Zambian government owe? And it's a simple question that has a very complicated answer. For you at the World Bank who's trying to measure all of this, how do you fill those gaps? Or do you have to put a lot of footnotes in your data that says, well, we just don't know this and we just don't know that. And so that the quality of the data now is not as reliable as it was, say, 20 years ago, when the lending patterns were much more traditional and conventional? Uh, this is a very good question. And uh, as Deborah was mentioning before, uh, we also play that forensic investigative uh, part of uh, our work at work. So there is a lot of uh, um, different uh, approaches when it comes to lending or borrowing from the countries. And there is a lot of uh, gray area where we cannot say that there is lack of transparency or the countries do not really know how to define their debt because of the new patterns new, uh, on the debt instruments, but also on the way of lending, uh, on the way how those uh, debt instruments change hands. And uh, so there is quite a lot of uh, work from our side. We're trying to improve and develop those methodologies and also in, uh, uh, expand the sources. Uh, before we used to go to the Ministry of Finance, GMOs, and get this information through the forms that are standard forms of the bank. Uh, now, last 10 years, we have been reaching out to central banks, reaching out to this uh, um, uh, agency units or um, government uh, offices that really collect this type of information that is not really uh, um, defined as debt by the government or by the legal uh, framework that the countries have. So we're trying to unify all this definition of debt uh, based on international standards and making countries understand how to define their own debt and how to manage that. The important part of this debt is not only uh, hiding debt from China or hiding debt from some uh, private company. It's more the capacity that those countries have to define what is actually uh, consisting on the debt portion versus equity portion and uh, how these countries can uh, uh, clearly uh, define their payment, their management of the liquidity to pay this debt in the future. So what the bank has been doing so far is giving technical assistance to countries to improve their data sources of information and also to define better their debt instruments. We have uh, recently working also with central banks to figure out this new format of debt through central bank to central bank uh, deposits or swap lines. They are very short term. They turn around in three months or a year. However, there are different types of agreement between those two central banks or government to a central bank regarding the, the uh, maturity of those rollout constantly of the money. And this is somehow for some people not debt because it's, you know, it's paid back every three months. However, this is a new way of leveraging the financial flows, international financial flows. And this is by any standard, it's external debt. So what the, the, central, the World Bank is doing is collecting all this type of information and putting together to build new methodologies uh, for countries, but also for us, so we can have a better breakdown on the debt instruments and debt coverage. Another thing that I have uh, always consistently um, mentioned also in our publication is that uh, there are a lot of legal frameworks that uh, decide on what to call debt. And those uh, legal frameworks are specifically uh, 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 specifying instruments, instrument coverage, well-defined orga organizational structures that do not probably cover the entire debt or entire uh, you know, set of, of creditors. We have been uh, pretty much uh, very transparent on how we compile and classify creditors. When it comes to uh, bilateral creditors, we do not uh, limit our uh, classification and definition only on bilateral creditors 
that uh, uh, are governments or government agencies. We have gone beyond that by including public corporation and also development banks, which are uh, re pretty much uh, being the aid of the government to you know, lend money through the government, uh, to lend money for the government, and we do not have any um, other terms but the bilateral, official bilateral terms. So there has been quite a lot of uh, transparency from the bank as well by explaining what is the definition, what is the methodology. For example, uh, in case of China as a lender, China Development Bank is a development bank that does not uh, um, keep deposits and it's pretty much a state funded. This is a public corporation. This is a bilateral, official bilateral creditor. And the bank has clearly defined that and they, we publish the data through this the, the type of methodology. However, we have to be very clear that sometimes when this uh, uh, government aid, being a development bank, uh, in case of uh, uh, Germany, KW, they have you know, this agency that the government really lends through this agency. However, there's IPEX Bank, which is a, uh, a subsidy of this uh, agency. They are fully private. So the, the bank has a, a clear uh, separation between the bilateral creditors uh, official and non-official. And, and uh, obviously the IPEX is, uh, is a private company and of course it's not a bilateral creditor. Yeah. So this has been quite a, a forensic and also um, um, we have been always in an education mode to make those countries understand what are, how to establish that concepts and definition, how to strengthen legal frameworks so they can have better transparency on every single uh, uh, commitment that they have either with a creditor as China or any other creditor. And of course, um, this requires building functional uh, debt recording management, uh, better dissemination systems. So it's not about only China as, uh, as a lender. It's pretty much all type of new debt instrument, new borrowing patterns that have been uh, making countries a little bit behind on their uh, you know, debt recording management and sure. defining how to, to manage this uh, framework across, across their departments and also uh, to be more transparent on their uh, debt towards any, okay. any, any creditor. Yeah, that's very, that's very insightful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Kevin, I'm gonna come to you now. And when your database launched last year, it caused quite a bit of stir because you revealed that lending had gone from the two policy banks, the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank from $75 billion in 2016 to four billion dollars in 2019, if I'm correct, and that caused a lot of attention internationally. And and Thea has a good question here. She says, "What has been the Chinese government's responses to these databases? And have you seen the databases used by the Chinese government or policy banks, even though they were quite controversial?" Uh, yeah, thanks. Um... Well, uh, we all know that the China Chinese government is is not uh, one one single uh, one single entity. That there is all, all sorts of different e entities and ministries and research institutes and, and so forth. So it, it really it really depends. Um, uh, I think in I think it was, I might get the year wrong, but I think it was something like 2017 when we did our 2017 update. Uh, it was covered by the Financial Times and in the Financial Times China uh, version. And uh, we were um, we were alerted from the China Development Bank uh, where we got some things wrong, um, and we were able to go correct that in the, in the next year. Um, and so they welcomed it, and but uh, saw that we you know said, hey, uh, in this particular country, in this particular loan, we've got a different story here. Uh, we don't engage with them at that level on on every single year. Uh, we know that a lot of our data sets are are used uh, quite frequently by a lot of the. Uh, by a lot of the sort of government-sponsored think tanks, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences for Latin America, for Africa, for engineering, and, and so forth. Um, and we've seen them cited in, in, a, in a number of different documents. And so we're not only providing sort of transparency uh, for, for folks outside, but also uh, within China. We're actually in, in negotiations with the Chinese Ministry of uh, Ecology and the Environment to actually house some of our data uh, with the Chinese government on, on the uh, Ministry of Environment webpage. Okay. Uh, Deborah, let me come to you. A uh, question from Yue Cao. 
he said, rec recognizing they are linked, which would you say is more problematic, deviating from international practices or practices of other major donors? China's lending or China's debt restructuring processes? You've done research on both. Which would you say is more problematic or neither? Well, that's a really good question, and it's hard to answer. Um, I think the that the lack of transparency is the, is the most problematic aspect um, because it's it's something where you know until we started doing uh, putting this data together, uh, Boston University and and us and and others, there was really no idea. Um, the and usually the estimates of what the Chinese were doing were way overblown. You know there would be. Uh, much larger, uh, the idea was that they were much larger than they actually were in terms of their lending. Now they've, they've caught up to those, <laughs> those early estimates now and they have become quite large, but I, I, I think they're still not as large as a lot of people think, even in the debt patterns um, from what we can see from the World Bank's data, which is actually tracks very closely with ours. Uh, the Chinese still, even in the low income countries that Evas talked about, they're still like 20 to 22% of the debt burden. And in terms of uh, debt, debt service, they're higher because uh, so many of the banks are lending on commercial terms. So it's about 30% of the debt service in those low income countries. But if we look at the broader, um, the broader landscape across, for example, in Africa, if you look at North and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, they're about 13%. So that's lower when you include the middle income countries. Worldwide, it's, uh, according to the World Bank's data, it's only 5% of overall lending. And then we can ask whether or not some of that data is not being reported. And I would say that we know one country that isn't being reported and that's Venezuela. So Venezuela does not report to the World Bank. And from Kevin Gallagher's work, we know that Chinese lending in Venezuela has been uh, up, upward of 60 billion. And the actual debt is what, 20, 25 billion or something that remains. So that's a big chunk, but you know we know about that. So it's, it's, um, it's not transparent, but but it is a known factor. Now, so the, the lending and the lack of transparency there is, is a problem. Um, and then in terms of the restructuring, well, it, it depends, who is it a problem for? So there, there's never been transparency about restructuring to people like us. You know, we're, we're sitting outside the Paris Club um, and there's transparency inside the Paris Club for bilateral creditors. Um, who are Paris Club members, so they can see what each other's doing. And then, of course, inside when the World Bank and the IMF went through the MDRI and the HIPIC, uh, the highly indebted poor countries debt cancellations, and there there was more transparency there because um, there they were telling uh, the whole world and all of the world's countries that are members. There. So there's more transparency. But even in restructuring. There isn't, you know, it's pretty much country by country, whether or not you can see information in the, um, the debt sustainability analyses or the regular article four consultation. So it's, it still depends on whether the country, uh, the borrower allows that transparency. So we're, um, yeah, so, so that the restructuring is, um, I suppose it, particularly for bond markets and for the international financial community, that's, it's an issue not knowing what the new uh, terms are and what the new debt position is. And that's something that doesn't uh, appear very quickly also in the international debt statistics. And we've been trying to track whether that information gets reflected now that we have that data on China. And it, it's hard to see it sometimes. <laughs> so maybe Evis can speak to that, but, but how the debt restructuring gets reflected again in their statistics, how do they update them? But, um, but there's, there's really nowhere to look for that. That's why Matthew's work um, at Rhodium has been so important to try to track that. Well, Matthew, let's dive into that very quickly. You and your colleague Agatha Kratz at Rhodium have done quite a bit on Chinese debt relief and debt restructuring. You've issued some really important reports. We've seen, particularly in Africa, for example, Angola got a major debt deferral deal. Something is happening in Zambia, although we don't quite know what. Uh, Afristar, there was a handover of services on the standard gauge railway to restructure part of Kenya's debt. Talks are underway in Ethiopia. The Chinese say that they have deferred more debt than any other member of the G20, somewhere around $2.1 billion. This goes to a question from Rebecca from the University of Toronto. Who, uh, who asks, how can we understand the patterns 
of debt forgiveness. One of the things that Deborah's brought up and Kevin is we don't have transparency into this whole process. So how do we actually know what they're doing? And she then goes on to say, while Chinese loans have been unconventional and defined in different ways, are there similar challenges with debt relief? Matt, why don't you take that one? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, and it, it's interesting uh, to, to step back to maybe the previous question for a second. When you talk about whether or not China's loans are problematic, you can view that kind of through two major lenses. The first is, are they problematic in terms of the outcomes that they cause uh, for borrowers or recipients? And then uh, maybe a different way of looking at it is, are they problematic compared to everyone else? Um, and you can view that uh, essentially, and one of the major challenges for Chinese lending is trying to figure out uh, because there is a lack of transparency and also because there is kind of a melange and a blending between aid and uh, commercial term lending, um, it, it's a matter of finding who is the benchmark. Are you comparing China to other aid institutions or are you comparing China to other commercial lenders? And so uh, you kind of have to take it almost at, at two different levels. Certainly in terms of the debt relief issue, um, because China's policies there are very clear in terms of straight write-offs, in some ways, it's a little bit less confusing because you don't have to get into the difference between aid and commercial term lending. Um, and this has been true for uh, since Deborah Brodigam uh, was writing about it in um, Dragon's Gift, uh, that zero interest loans, which are a very small portion of China's uh, overseas lending, uh, are the loans that are eligible to be written off. Um, it goes to a question of why do we know more about them? And indeed, in our data set, zero interest loans are the majority by case number that we track uh, it goes to the incentives of countries to disclose information to clear up some of those uh, some of those murky conditions. Uh, well, there are certain pressures uh, for uh, China uh, and its institutions as far as how they talk about aid and how they talk about debt. In general, everyone wants to disclose that they are writing off a small uh, loan, small zero interest loan that doesn't have major effects either on creditors' bottom lines uh, or uh, changes uh, the the major state of play in debt in a in a given country. Where it's been more complicated and certainly where it comes into uh, evaluating deferrals that have been provided to, as you mentioned, you know, Zambia and Angola, whether it's part of the DSSI, whether it's part of the, the new common framework now, um, it's a question of what countries can uh, expect. Um, when you talk about deferrals, China has been very, very clear, I think, with regards to its commercial term lending uh, and certainly in terms of its past practices, that the best that countries can expect are deferrals. Uh, and you do see changes in the length of the deferrals, less for Zambia, because it's more of a concern, potentially longer for other countries, especially if you look outside of Africa. Um, at the same time, though, the, the ongoing question is, it goes back to the, the issue of framing, um, is uh, when does China want to treat its loans as commercial and thus subject to a little bit more of a, a harsher or somewhat less forgiving perspective? Uh, and when is China treating them uh, as more concessional instruments, more aid-like instruments. Um, certainly there's a mark even between uh, inside of the banks. Uh, you see major differences in terms of how easily China XM relatively has uh, deferred uh, concessional loans uh, and a lot more complication with its commercial term lending. Uh, in CDB, it's all you know, running the gamut, whether or not CDB is being approached, whether they're willing to provide temporary deferrals uh, and certainly uh, a lack of coordination between XM, CDB and other Chinese lenders. So uh, in some ways, uh, I think China has sort of been clear about what it thinks the ground rules are. We're willing to write off zero interest loans uh, through SIGCA. Uh, we are willing to deal with China XM concessional loans. Um, but again, that lack of transparency uh, and a lack of clear delineation uh, makes it difficult, I think, for countries sometimes to know what they can expect. Uh, and we have to somewhat infer based on past practice and, and what's going on uh, with the prevailing mood is. And it makes it very, very difficult to see what trajectory is for a lot of these major uh, restructurings. Yeah, and about the those zero interest loans make up less than 5% of China's overall debt uh, portfolio in Africa. So it is quite small in that. And there's also an excellent paper from Yuan Sun at the Stimson Center explaining how China does not forgive debt. So I recommend people look that up as well. Avis, let me come to you. Uh, lately, China has been providing a number of currency swaps for countries that face forex shortages. I don't need you to speak directly to China here because I know that's not part of our ground rules. But Umesh wants to know, do you or the World Bank consider currency swaps as debt as well? Um, yes. So um, a short answer is yes, but I'm going to elaborate a little bit more. When you have an asset or an increase on an asset, you definitely have a liability as well. 
So uh, based on the standards of defining debt, uh, which is any liability that requires a payment of interest, it's considered to be debt. Um, swap lines, deposits, either short term, are considered to be that because they are leveraging and increasing the reserves assets of the country from the central bank. And uh, um, let, let, let's talk about the deposit uh, of a government or a central bank to a central bank. And this reserve assets have also a counter account with these liabilities. One of the cases that are similar uh, are also uh, SDR allocation versus SDR holding. The IMF uh, SDR uh, holding, which is increasing the assets of the government, and the uh, reserves assets are also liabilities for the government. This new ter uh, term and definition of debt uh, on SDR allocation, SDR holding, has been implemented and introduced in the Balance of Payments Manual Edition 6 and all the international standards, starting with the mother of all SNA. And uh, so according to the debt definition, this is considered to be um, external debt. However, the maturity is one of the issues that we are, as a bank, looking through to find out if this is a short-term or a long-term maturity, or it's a separate as we separate the long-term, short-term, and use of credit and then loans from the IMS. So this is a particular case that we're trying to figure out uh, to put it in the right place when it comes to maturity. However, um, this is a def debt by definition. Okay. Uh, since we're running close on time before Anna joins us, and I want to make sure I get this particular question before we leave, because I know we have quite a few uh, students uh, in the audience today and also people who are not from this field. So Chetna had a very, very good question, and I'd like you all to give a very short answer, okay? But can the panelists recommend a good starting point for a novice researcher to understand the different definitions, examples of debt, and how lending practices have evolved over time? Where can people get started with this issue? Kevin, let's start with you. Again, debt for dummies. That's me included. I would take a look at the methodological notes that go behind uh, all of us who put together these data sets. It's not, uh, not fun reading. Make sure you have some caffeine. But it's a, a nice, clear, uh, nice, clear understanding. Uh, each group tries to get very specific about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Deborah, how about you? Novice researchers, where do they get started? That's a good place. I, I would, without mind, pitch my own uh, book. I'd say in The Dragon's Gift, I, I laid out um, a, a discussion of the different Chinese lending instruments and uh, the different Chinese lenders. And so I, what I didn't include there was the contractors. And we can see now that there's a lot of finance coming from Chinese contractors. That, but I, I hope Eva will give, give us a, a little bit of an introduction for, for dummies about SNA, because that's, that's the Bible, as she said, of all these definitions. And that's really something that without an accounting degree is, is hard to parse. And so Ava, tell, tell, Ava, tell us about SNA and, and again, explain what that is, just so we understand. Um, so uh, there is a, um, a national account. So uh, there are standards of the national accounts when the countries uh, um, set up a framework of the real uh, economy statistics, including all the um, you know, GDP, GNI, um, bank payments, IP, uh, government statistics. So all together creating those accounts that the government uh, um, follows to cross compare the data uh, across uh, based on uh, external real sector and financial sector of the economy. Okay, and, and Matthew, let's come to you finally very quickly in terms of what would you recommend for students, novices, people outside the field to get a, a good start in this? So uh, Dr. Brodergram hesitates to say her own book. I won't hesitate to say that. I, I think it's an amazing place to start. Um, but more generally, um, I find, and when we have interns or students that come into work, uh, I find it sometimes better to start with basics. And while it can get a little bit technical, uh, starting by uh, reviewing IMF Article 4 reports, looking at, uh, well, it can get technical, but skimming or taking a look at uh, the debt sustainability uh, analysis framework, uh, especially for small countries, uh, gives you a sense of how these things interact uh, certainly, uh, you occasionally get lucky from a research perspective uh, where you see how debt can be rescheduled and it can be broken out by a creditor. Um, but that can be very, very helpful as a starting point uh, and then use other sources to look at the China specific spin. Okay. Well, since uh, that was a great place to end our Q&A session, and since Anna now has joined us,
a very good morning, Anna. I'm going to hand it back to my colleague, Kobus, who will introduce uh, Anna for us. Um, Anna is, uh, is the Anne Fleming Research Professor at Georgetown Law um, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, she, she has published research on government debt contracts and the regulation of finance, financial institutions and markets. Um, she also co-authored a law textbook on international finance and has contributed to international initiatives on financial reform and government debt. So she fits right in. Um, so yeah, Anna, um, why don't you start by just giving us a, a, a very brief intro to how you actually do your work? Like what, what are the, the kind of specific kind of methodological kind of guardrails that, that, that you keep to? Um, well, thank you very much. And I'm very sorry about uh only being here for the last half hour. This has been a terrifically uh, interesting series and I've learned a lot from <laughs> the videos. Um, the, uh, so the project that brings me here is actually quite unusual uh, for me. I'm a law professor. I, um, I do some qualitative empirical work. We've done several studies uh, of uh, government debt managers, for example, and uh, government debt contracts. But uh, for the most part, it's uh, qualitative or um, just a plain old uh, mix of doctrinal and theoretical law review articles. So again, this is not um, the usual genre. The paper that uh, I think uh, maybe of more interest to this group is one that just came out a couple of weeks ago that's co-authored with uh, folks at uh, CGD, um, uh, Scott Morris, uh, Christoph Trevish, Sebastian Horn at the Kiel Institute, and they've done some terrific work on sovereign debt litigation in particular um, that I recommend to anyone who would uh, be interested in this space. And then uh, Brad Parks at Aid Data, um, of course, and the question there has been, um, actually the way it happened was um, uh, Scott and Brad had uh, seen some Chinese bilateral debt contracts and what they uh, we were talking about was whether these are normal, where, whether they're in the mainstream or outside. And of course, because my focus is sovereign debt contracts, um, it was a somewhat hilarious question because there is no normal in this space. And so um, that's why I thought this was um, a particularly interesting project to delve into and actually one that particularly over time, uh, you know, would be um, well suited to also quantitative uh, analysis. Um, this particular contract is, uh, some of you may know, uh, uh, this is um, a set of 100 contracts, 100 bilateral contracts. Um, and in most cases, we have the full text, um, and uh, which is especially gratifying to me as a contracts teacher and researcher. And uh, I honestly don't believe I know anything about a project unless I see the actual contract text. And I'm not happy when it's just a prospectus, which is a description of the contracts. Um, so here, uh, what we found was fascinating to me because um, Chinese lenders use um, many standard commercial forms. They tend to be on the aggressive creditor friendly side of that spectrum. Um, the economic terms are quite interesting, um, particularly when it comes to collateralization, but also uh, not that difficult to explain if you're looking at a muscular creditor. But then there are also a few questions, a few um, clauses that are unique uh, to Chinese lenders, in particular the um, undertaking by the debtor not to bring the contract into uh, coordinated international restructuring initiatives like Paris Globe comparability. Um, and, uh, and then there are others, and this is the last thing I think I'll flag, where the language of the contract is 
roughly within the commercial norm, but the fact that uh, it is a government actor that is using this language gives the language somewhat different meaning. And um, so with that, I think that's probably more than enough for an introduction. And if anyone has questions, we'd like to follow up. Yeah, so Anna, we have a question from Bryce. You mentioned the no Paris club clause that was found in the Cameroon contracts and Cameroon provided a nice treasure trove of your of your of your data set. And uh, what Bryce wants to know is are these sorts of clauses outliers or are they representative of contracts that are likely to be in place in other countries as well with regard to that that no Paris club clause. The no Paris club clause we only found in contracts between um, Chinese lenders and other countries, right? So these were not a Cameroon um, uh, uh, feature uh, and they are unique. Now in the paper, we do give examples of clauses that have been around that kind of feel the same. So in uh, the Brady bonds in the late eighties in particular, ooh, there go contracts. Um, there was a, a clause that uh, said something like um, the debtor promises never to restructure this debt again or something like that right now it's when you pull back and think about it it's really not something that um, is very meaningful when it in the context of um, enforceable contractual obligations right so if the debtor stops paying they A, have breached their promise to pay, and B, you know, if they ask you to restructure, I suppose they've also breached the promise never to restructure, but that's kind of secondary to the fact that they're not paying you. And, you know, what is the remedy to go to court and make them pay? Well, that's sort of the same remedy as if they miss a payment. It's, um, it's a curious bird, same thing with, uh, you know, the Paris clauses of what happens if the debtor goes to the Paris Club and then asks um, China Development Bank or China Exim Bank for comparability. Um, are you going to call the loan if it's being serviced already? It's um, So I would attribute these to, um, at some level, they're just interorum, right? Don't even try. And some debtors might not, others might test it. When combined with, um, giving lenders control over bank accounts, it becomes a much more meaningful clause, right? So if, uh, let's say you ask for comparability and your lender has the next three payments in, uh, a, in an escrow account or in a revenue account that they control, well, they can just freeze the account and then bargain from a position of greater strength. Um, but that's the way in which I would think about enforcing them, right? Not, you know, going to court and saying, hey, you know, my debtor went to the Paris Club, tell them not to. It's, right. it's a strange contractual bird. One of the complaints that Kevin, Deborah, and Matt talked about is the lack of transparency. Your contract and your research that you found in the data set also had a lot of details about uh, secrecy clauses, and really gave us the, the the reasons why we don't see that much about the loans, but from the other side looking in. Andres has a question and saying, how can the United States, in your view, effectively expose where China is in violation of the rules and norms of global institutions? And and how, and again, is there anything that can be done from outside forces in to force and to compel the Chinese to be more transparent? Uh, or is this a bilateral relationship between China and its borrowers. And there's really nothing that anybody can do outside of those two parties. Um, so I think this is absolutely important and it's a terrific question because the first thing the US can do is, oh, I don't know, publish US XM bilateral contracts. That would be awfully nice. Um, the uh, transparency is a sore point, particularly for um, bilateral official creditors. Some of them publish. Japan's Exim, for reasons I don't know, publishes a lot. Um, others, not so much. Um, the contracts that um, where we saw the most expansive confidentiality clauses, 
um, and that would be China Exim Bank contracts after 2014, have an interesting carve out, except as required by law. If borrowing countries had laws on the books that required disclosure of the contracts, even if it's disclosure to the parliament or you know, parliamentary committee or some such, right? That makes that confidentiality clause um, you know, inoperable um, or it creates a very large um, kind of escape valve, if you will. My understanding is that you know, all the contracts in the 100 contract um, database uh, come from public sources. Most of them um, were somewhere on parliamentary websites, the official gazettes, that kind of thing. Now, those are incredibly hard to navigate, far from obvious, but um, so there's the accessibility question. And in many of those cases, it's not really clear that even disclosure was required, but maybe parliamentary approval was required and that's how the contracts made it into the space. So A, the G20, G7 need to you know, get going and articulate the fact that it's not just debt transparency in general, but it's very particular kinds of disclosure. Um, sorry, dog. Um, disclosure should be the norm um, and look, if, if you don't want to tell people about your missiles, that's fine, but that's not most of these contracts, right? right. So, Lead by example. G7, um, yeah, I mean, and the common, like, look, China's part of the G20. Um, they need to say that public debt is public, right? That's point number one. Example, release your own. Right or tell us why you don't. The UK is actually moving in the direction of more and more and more disclosure, including with their export credit agencies, um, and uh, and then borrowing countries. And I think that that's an underemphasized point. We tend to we have this reflex to go to IMF conditionality to sanctions. Um, the primary audience for disclosure is the domestic audience. It's the people whose you know work is going to pay this debt back. So. As a first priority, I would have, um, you know, domestic disclosure laws. Perhaps connect them to some of the authorization requirements, and then we could pick that up at the international level um, and uh, try to make this uh, make it bite. But I think that that's where we start. Okay, uh, that was very helpful. Uh, I'd like to invite Cobus and the rest of the panelists to come back up onto the stage because we're gonna wrap up our discussion because we wanna make sure we get out of here on time. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Cobus for everybody to do some final thoughts before we leave. Um, thanks so much. Um, so, you know, this, this, this issue is so wide ranging that it's, it's very difficult to, to kind of hone in on any kind of specific issue around, around final thoughts, but I was, um, we, we also, I think, as, as Kevin um, alluded to, we also, I think, at a moment of, of crisis or, or, you know, many people are discussing the current debt situation as, as a form of crisis. I wonder if you could end um, by providing your perspectives on that issue. Like, do you see it as a crisis based on your own work? And, and what do you think the, the, the next steps are? And maybe we should start with Deborah and then we can, we can move on from there. Maybe, I think Deborah maybe stepped away from our computer for a moment. Um, Kevin, maybe, uh, do you wanna, do you wanna oh, start? I'm here, oh, but oh. I am unable to start my video because the host- Oh, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I can speak. Um, all right, so, uh, all right, I'm still unable to stop. Okay, uh, so the, is it a crisis? Um, I think we're, for some countries, there. Um, for some countries, it is clearly a crisis. Um, and uh, these are the countries that we saw at high risk or already in debt crisis before the pandemic hit. And so um, there in, in Africa, we see the, the same countries coming up, um, which is Zambia, Angola, Kenya, um, Chad, Ethiopia, probably we'll see again Cameroon. Um, 
possibly Djibouti, although almost all of these countries, uh, with a few exceptions, had already seen um, debt restructuring or, or even refinancing, as in the case of Angola. So for those countries um, that were kind of insolvent before the crisis hit, it, it continues. And then there, it's a less clear what's happening with the other countries in terms of those that had liquidity issues primarily. And so, um, and then the role that Chinese lending plays in many, in the majority of those countries is actually fairly small, uh, less than 10%, a few between 10 and 20%. So, so there, there is a crisis, but it's not yet um, clear that it's widespread as a debt crisis across a number of countries, even if in the aggregate and some of China's largest borrowers, uh, the crisis is more acute, um, Ethiopia, Zambia, and so on. So I'd say that it, the picture is varied um, and it's not an, an absolute picture. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Kevin, how does it look from your perspective? Uh, I'm having trouble getting my video back on. Here we go. Uh, well, it's been great to be part of this conversation with everyone, and I'll just reiterate a, a couple things and, and answer that question. Um, number one, uh, none of us are, are looking to do all this uh, research. It would be great if, uh, if all of the actors were much more transparent on this. And I'll echo what I said earlier and what Anna said, the best way that the United States and others in the West uh, can get China to uh, to improve on this is to lead by example that, uh, as I said in my initial remarks, China's lack of transparency in all, a lot of these loans is not unique. Export Import Bank of the United States, French Development Bank, South Korean Development Bank also need to do a lot of work on this. Maybe we need some sort of OECD coordination on that uh, in the Western level. Um, but this isn't just about uh, uh, bean counters and wonks trying to do our academic research because now we're in the midst of a uh, looming global debt crisis. The World Economic Outlook that just came out before the IMF spring readings uh, shows that given the fact that the advanced economies pummeled over $17 trillion of fiscal and monetary stimulus and we're starting to recover, uh, we might cool off and raise interest rates. The overwhelming amount of uh, of uh, uh, foreign debt in emerging market and developing countries uh, could uh, be in the form of capital outflows, which would depreciate currencies even more and balloon the debt that uh, was already seen as at uh, close to distress in about two fifths of the poor countries uh, and many uh, emerging market and developing countries. The G20 scheme is not adequate to deal with this looming, looming crisis and the debt overhang that's going to happen because of, uh, because of COVID. Uh, it only deals with lowest low income countries. It only really meaningful deals with uh, official bilateral assistance, much of which what we've talked about today is, is not covered in it. Um, it's amazing in that context that uh, Matthew has uncovered over a hundred, uh, all of the Chinese debt relief that uh, has occurred over the past year. Uh, given how misaligned these incentives are, if you look at all the debt in emerging market and developing countries, number one, uh, the majority of it, or at least a third of it, is private sector bondholder debt, which is not, a, not part of these schemes. Um, and the majority of it is in middle income countries that are not part of, part of these schemes. Uh, in addition to stepping up and leading by example with transparency, uh, Sean Hagen, uh, one of uh, one of Anna's colleagues at both Georgetown at the Peterson Institute uh, has argued that the United States could put in place an executive order to get the um, to get the private sector to get more engaged in, in a proposal called debt relief for a green and inclusive recovery that I did with colleagues. Uh, we think the multilateral development banks, which haven't done much in this uh, in this space, could provide Brady bond like guarantees to bring the private sector to the table as well. Um, this is a, a looming crisis. We have an incredible set of development and climate change goals that we've been trying to mobilize trillions of dollars for to meet goals in 2030. All of those will be derailed um, if we have a looming debt crisis and China will not be to blame for this. Uh, our collective efforts will be. Thank you. Um, so Matt, um, from your perspective, um, you know, kind of what does it look like from, from the private sector side? 
Uh, yes, certainly. I think uh, as, a, as a private research uh, group and, and one that has clients that are, are located around the world, um, I think we're constantly trying to balance the need to describe uh, the uh, certainly unprecedented crisis that's happening worldwide uh, and the challenge that COVID presents to a lot of emerging markets, but also developed countries, and to cover honestly, both the China elements that contribute to that, but also as both Deborah and uh, Kevin have mentioned, uh, the non-China elements that come into that. Uh, it is certainly uh, from the private side, a lot of what we're trying to do at Rhodium Group is to uh, look at some of the hidden factors that are also contributing uh, that may not necessarily be as apparent uh, as say a, a big uh, DSSI deferral uh, or a larger structuring under say a common framework, uh, but to identify uh, those countries that are also potentially in trouble latently are flying under the radar. Uh, we've seen in Pakistan and Mongolia uh, that are hanging on uh, in part due to uh, the use of uh, Chinese bilateral swaps as a, as a bailout. Uh, we see countries that may not necessarily have major China debt issues, as Dr. Brodigan pointed out, but are struggling with high commercial debt loads with bond markets and other private creditors. Uh, and so it is uh, always a challenge to both track China's uh, problems and uh, China's challenges in lending honestly, uh, and faithfully, but also to put them into a bigger context uh, and to make sure we don't lose track of, of what happens to the recipient countries. Um, to the question of is this uh, what the best way out of the crisis is, I think uh, a lot of the other panelists have already spoken to specifics, but in general, it goes back to transparency uh, and building capacity, as, as Avis mentioned, not just in terms of the ability to identify uh, and manage debt, uh, but starting all the way back from when these contracts are first drafted. Um, uh, Professor Gelpern's paper, I think, is excellent, partially uh, because it exposes uh, some of the specific terms, but it also, also uh, highlights some of the major differences that you see across contracts. Um, you see, for example, in the Philippines and Argentina, uh, while they have some of the same language uh, that you see in some of the Exxon contracts, like the No Paris Club contracts or non-disclosure uh, clauses, you do see differences where they have managed to insert language that may allow for potentially more transparency or a wider scope of situations where they can be transparent. Um, I think another factor that's also come up here is uh, the need for international organizations uh, and the OECD to lead the way forward. We've seen ideas uh, from the IMF on how to handle sovereign debt issues. Uh, you've also seen uh, the concept of potentially green swaps. Um, and certainly it's going to be necessary moving forward because uh, as uh, Professor Gelpern has pointed out, whether you're dealing with China, whether you're dealing with other uh, commercial creditors, other bilateral creditors, uh, arbitration, uh, litigation, enforcement, uh, I think are not going to be enough uh, for countries that are facing acute Chinese debt pressures, acute uh, commercial debt pressures, uh, or just simply COVID stress. Uh, and it's going to take more coordination, uh, more transparency, uh, and I think good faith efforts from all involved uh, to, to get out of the, the crisis and hopefully put everyone on a better footing. Um, Evis, um, whatever crisis there is, the World Bank is going to be right in the middle of it. Um, so I was wondering, you know, kind of how, how you see this discussion. Uh, I cannot start my video, but I can speak. Um, yes, well, the COVID-19 crisis arrived to a moment of, uh, especially for the poor countries, of particular uh, difficulties. Uh, in 2019, almost half of the low-income countries either were in high uh, risk or debt distress. This pandemic is not making it easier for them. Uh, the pandemic has ended a two decades track of steady global progress in the poverty reduction. And uh, this pandemic has created quite a lot of uh, uh, backward move. It's, uh, you know, a pandemic is projected to have more uh, people in extreme poverty and the risk of this country, especially the poor countries, um, will be that after this pandemic is over, a large debt overhang will be, take, will be taking years to manage. And uh, with this complicating picture of debt, this fast changing landscape of financial market, um, this trend suggests that the future um, the sovereign debt restructuring will be even more complex in the years to come especially for the poorer countries. How do we fix this? Well, this is, um, you know, it comes down to transparency. It has to be a bilateral transparency when it comes to uh, not only debtors and borrowers, 
being more meticulous and more transparent on their borrowing, but also the creditors have to be joining this transparency and uh, disclose better information and data so we can have all as a community a better outcome of this crisis. Um. And uh, finally, um, the you know your your recent work um, <clears throat> to, together with Kiel and um, and uh, you know and colleagues at A Data have really brought us face to face with with what this kind of lack of transparency looks like. Um, so I was wondering what your final thoughts are of about the the you know kind of these issues that that Evers mentioned and also you know with within the context of of uh, this current discussion of a potential debt crisis. So uh, thank you uh, for the question and, and thanks to everyone for their thoughts because I do largely agree with uh, everything I've uh, everything everyone else has said. Look, there's and Deborah said there's an enormous range of circumstances and uh, debt composition among countries, and that makes it difficult to design. You, know, you can't have one clause that solves everybody's problems. Frankly, you can't have you know a single institution that solves everybody's problem uh, problems. I think that um, you know uh, Kevin's point on the importance of on, on the need for uh, you know, OECD coordination or some set of disciplines that um, articulate and reinforce shared norms of which there are not enough in the space. Um, as far as I can tell. Um, Matthew made a really important point that I want to emphasize, which is debtors have agency, right? Um, how much may vary case by case, but um, when you hear that a contract is standard, um, one word can make a big difference, right? So, um, you know, in uh, uh, there's one confidentiality clause where China, sort of Chinese lender uses totally standard commercial phrasing minus one word and it changes the meaning completely, right? And sometimes the debtors are just not aware of this and frankly, they don't have the bandwidth to deal with it. So how to um, give debtors agency and reinforce that agency, I think is an important point. Um, so the one thing that I wanna, add as perhaps a gloss on this is, um, to me, the big challenge now is complexity, right? This is so the kind of coordination problems that so the sovereign debt literature was worried about when bonds became the dominant funding instrument at the turn of the century. Um, those were nothing compared to what we have now. Chad is the first common framework case. Um, its uh, biggest creditor is Glencore. How Glencore restructures is an interesting question. Um, we don't know whether they do or not, the entire enterprise hinges on it. So common framework, not enough, but common framework also has an unprecedented task ahead of it. And, um, and I think it's also really important that we don't get caught, sort of unwittingly provide excuses for any individual player in this group, right? So just because, uh, you know, China does it doesn't mean you get to, just because France has a confidentiality clause doesn't mean that China's confidentiality clauses are okay. Um, and one last bit of gloss on this complexity point, we should not get bogged down in classification. So this whole debate about whether China Development Bank is official or commercial is utterly beside the point. Everybody needs to contribute. And when you look at the contracts, it really gives you insight into just how hybrid this space is, right? So, um, you know, the China Development Bank, which is the biggest lender in a lot of these places, has crossed defaults to adverse actions to, against any PRC entity. Is it commercial? Is it official? I don't really care. I just want to make sure the country comes out with a sustainable debt um, profile. And that's the end of that. Thank you.
That's a fantastic point to end on. Thank you. Um, so we just would like to to thank Say Scary for for this this annual conference. It's it's an, an amazing resource. Um, today's session and all of their sessions are are being recorded. Um, this one should be up in, in three to four days um, on YouTube. And um, please also follow them them on Twitter and Facebook. Please sub subscribe to their newsletter. And just a, a, a great um, uh, you know kind of just just a thank you so much to also to all of the all of the participants it's an amazing group of people um it's we feel really honored to, to have the chance to speak with all of you and thank you also to everyone who, who listened it was a fantastic session thanks so much thanks everyone <laughs>